Hey, welcome to Nourishable. I'm Dr. Lara. In this mini lecture, we are going to navigate the nutrition facts panel. So our goals during today's mini lecture are to discuss the nutrition information that is provided by the nutrition facts panel, talk about where that information comes from, and also how you can use it when making food decisions. Um, I recommend that for the, this lecture that you have a food package of some kind with you that you can use to, uh, to walk through the content. I will be using my favorite kind of muesli, Alpen muesli, um, to walk through some of this information with you. So the first thing that we want to talk about are what are the requirements according to the FDA that have to be on a food label. So we'll walk through these together. The first is pretty obvious, the product name. So we have to have the product name um, on our food label. So we have Alpen Muesli right here. Uh, the next requirement is the manufacturer's name and address. So you can look around your food package to see where that is. I see that here, manufactured for three sister cereal, P.O. Box, Blah, 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 Lakeville, Mon uh, Manitoba, product of Canada. I didn't actually didn't know that. I love this muesli and I'm from Canada and that makes me like it even more. Okay, next, uh, the food label has to state the amount that's in a package. So we see that across here, net weight 14 ounces. The next thing that have to be listed are all of the ingredients that um, are part of this food. And the, specifically, the order that these ingredients are listed in is very important. They are uh, listed in, or, in descending order by weight. So the first ingredient that you see is gonna be at the highest amount in the product and then lesser and lesser as you go down the list. So I see my ingredients are whole grain oats, whole grain wheat, raisins coated with expeller pressed sunflower oil, almonds, and hazelnuts. Um, now, this ingredients list is heavily regulated by the FDA. There was kind of a funny story a few years ago where there was a granola company that said that one of their ingredients was love, and the FDA slapped them on the wrist for that. So, you know, they do, they do regulate what those ingredients are because they are, it is very important that it is completely transparent what the ingredients are in a food. The next thing that have to be listed are food allergens. The FDA requires that um, a food lists if it contains any of the top eight allergens. Those allergens are peanuts, tree nuts, milk, eggs, wheat, shellfish, finfish, or soy. Um, this is something that I personally have to pay a lot of attention to because I have a, an anaphylactic allergy to peanuts and soy, um, but this is something that is required to be listed um, by the FDA. Now, uh, in November of 2020, the FDA has also started to encourage food companies to list sesame as well. Sesame is another uh, pretty common food allergy. It's basically considered the number nine most common food allergy in the US. So if I look at my Alpen muesli, this one contains wheat, it contains hazelnuts, and it contains almonds. So, and they have to list it in a nice bold font so that it's very obvious when people with food allergies or people cooking for people with food allergies can see those food allergens listed very prominently. And then the next regulated aspect of the food label is the nutrition facts panel, which we will uh, dig into in much more detail. Now, those are the requirements for a food label. There's other optional things that can be on there for marketing purposes. Um, so for example, this Alpen Muesli, it has a non-GMO verified label. It also has a whole grain label on it. That's a whole nother very interesting, somewhat complicated story for another day. So let's dig into this nutrition facts panel a little bit more. This nutrition facts panel is heavily regulated. So now what we know already is that the DRIs, the dietary reference intakes, are specific to um, life stage and specific to gender. So if we look at this nutrition facts panel, think about how confusing it would be if it had to list different DRIs for every life stage and gender. There would be just too much information. So what the FDA did is they created some different standards for how to express the amounts of nutrients in a food and how to relate them to people in a way um, that, uh, that's referring to a particular reference. So the way that they did this is the FDA developed the daily values system. And they developed the daily values, or DV, using two different standards that are really derived from the DRIs. So the first standard that is used to, uh, to develop the daily values are the reference daily intakes, or RDIs. Now, uh, RDIs, 
same letters in a different order than the DRIs, alphabet soup continues. Okay, the, but what are the reference uh, daily intakes or the RDIs? Um, we use RDIs for micronutrients that have RDAs. And now again, you may still be thinking, but you know, there's the RDA is gonna be different depending on the life stage or the gender. So what they do is they pick the highest RDA for any age group over four years. So that way there's only one value that needs to be listed for each of those different micronutrients. The second standard that is used to create the daily values are the daily reference values or DRVs. And we'll use a DRV for energy producing nutrients. So those are the macronutrients, the focus of our course, um, as well as nutrients without RDAs. So all those nutrients that have AIs, but no specific RDA. Um, and in order to uh, create these daily reference values, we're going to create a reference diet. Um, so the diet will be a 2000 calorie reference diet and the proportion of macronutrients in that diet will be 35% fat, 55% carb and 10% protein. So the, um, that means when we're looking, thinking back to those AMDRs, the acceptable, acceptable macronutrient distribution ranges, that that 35% fat, that is right at the upper threshold of the AMDR for fat. The 55% carb, that is right at the kind of the middle of the AMDR for carb. And then 10% protein is at the low range for the protein AMDR. But that is our standard 2000 kilocalorie diet that is used in when expressing these um, percent daily values. So now from there, the nutrition facts panel is going to use these, um, these daily values and it will uh, for, a, for the particular food that you're looking at, it will express the nutrients in that food as a percent daily value of this 2000 calorie diet. So um, let's take a look down here. So if we look at this example nutrition facts panel here, we can see uh, these different nutrients are listed as percent daily values. So at eight grams of fat, that is 10% daily value according to this standard reference diet. We go, go down this way. Now, what you may notice is that there is no percent daily value listed for protein. Um, and that is because uh, the FDA said you do, food companies don't have to list a percent daily value for protein. If they do list a percent daily value for protein, then that food has to um, have its protein content measured by the FDA and it's pretty expensive. So um, a lot of foods will just list the number of grams of protein, but not the percent daily value of protein. And they end up getting to that gram of protein more by kind of subtract, uh, subtraction, figuring out what all the other macronutrients are, and then the protein is whatever's left. Now, there are some situations where food companies are gonna want to list that percent daily value for protein. Um, typically, that will be if a food wants to use the label that it is a high protein food. In order to be considered a high anything food, um, it ha that food has to give at least 20% uh, or more of the daily value of that nutrient within a serving. So, you know, that kind of makes sense where if there's a particular food that wants to label itself as a high protein food, maybe it's an energy bar of some kind, it may make sense for that company to pay the money to make sure they, that they can um, list their percent daily value of protein so that they can make that claim. But that is kind of gen our general nutrition facts panel and where these different numbers are coming from. When you're using it, what you have to think back to is, is this 2000 kilocalorie reference diet with 35% fat, 55% carb, 10% protein, how similar or applicable is that to you? Or how applicable is that to the person who's making decisions based on this nutrition facts panel? So let's take a look at what it's, at some of these daily values for the macronutrients. These were just recently updated when the uh, Nutrition Facts panel went through a whole revamp back in 2016. So um, the, da the daily value for total fat is 78 grams, saturated fat, 20 grams. We don't need to read them all. 
but um, they go down this way. Some of the new things that were added is a daily value for added sugar of 50 grams. And this relates back to the 2015 Dietary Guidelines, which was the first time that there were um, uh, really a threshold or a cap listed for added sugar, where the Dietary Guidelines said you want to be consuming 10% of your energy or less as added sugar. And so if we think back to that 2000 kilocalorie diet, that um, equals, you know, 10% of your daily calories would be 50 grams of sugar. So this is kind of an interesting one in that you're not aiming to consume 50 grams of added sugar per day. You actually want to aim to consume less than this daily value of added sugar. Um, the daily value for dietary fiber was also bumped up um, with the last FDA uh, revamp of the Nutrition Facts panel. And the, um, the other thing that I wanted to point out here that we talked a little bit about in the last slide is the idea that in order for a food to, list, to be listed as a food that is low in nutrient X or a food that is high in nutrient X, um, there are particular thresholds of the percent daily value. So a food that is low in nutrient X has to be 5% or less daily value for that nutrient. And then to be considered a food that is high in that uh, in nutrient X, it has to be 20% or higher daily value of that particular nutrient. Okay, so I have been alluding to this fact that the Nutrition Facts panel has gone through a big revamp. So um, this is the old Nutrition Facts panel over here that we will use for reference. This revamp to the Nutrition Facts panel um, was originally published in 2016. There was a deadline originally of 2018 for all food companies to shift from the old to the new Nutrition Facts panel. That ended up getting pushed out and the, finally the deadline was January 1st of 2020. So all of the food, um, food packages should have the new Nutrition Facts panel on it now. So let's take a look at what some of the updates were to that Nutrition Facts panel and see how they improve the usability of the Nutrition Facts panel. So one of the first things that we can see is that the calories, the calories per serving is much bigger and bolder. Um, this really helps draw more attention to the calories that are in one serving of food. The other thing that changed, they also bolded and made the serving size more obvious. Um, and in some cases, for some foods, they actually change the serving size a little bit to more re accurately reflect serving sizes that people actually eat. So that's another change. Um, another change that we don't see in these two examples here, but you might see on some food, food packages, such as a pint of ice cream, for example, is you may see two versions of the Nutrition Facts panel, one that lists all of the percent daily values for a serving size, and then another that lists all the percent daily values and calories if you consumed the entire package. And that is for foods where it is conceivable to consume the entire package at once, like hmm, a pint of ice cream, for example, or say um, a bottle of soda, where typically you would, you probably would consume the whole package at once. And so um, one of these updates was also listing all this information in uh, to report what would, be, what would happen if you consume the entire package of what, at once, which is frequently a way that people consume those foods. I have definitely consumed an entire pint of ice cream at once. It happens. Okay, now um, the next uh, change was that several of these percent daily, or the, uh, several of these daily values were um, updated and changed. We talked about how um, the daily value for fiber was, was increased, for example. And then fourth, there were a few additional nutrients that now have to be reported on the Nutrition Facts panel. One of them is added sugars. Um, and that I think is actually the change in the Nutrition Facts panel that I was the most excited about when it first came out. Um, because now we see that a total carbohydrates are listed and then that's broken down into dietary fiber to and total sugars. And then it'll separately list the number of grams of added sugar. And so I think this is a really important change because it allows consumers to be able to look at a food and be able to differentiate between the naturally occurring sugar in the food from the added sugar. And it's really the added sugar that we want to focus on reducing in our diet. So I think that's a really helpful change there. Um, some of the other nutrients that now have to be reported on the Nutrition Facts panel are listed down here. So we see back in the old version, they used to have to list vitamin A, 
vitamin C, calcium, and iron. But now um, vitamin A and vitamin C aren't really nutrients of concern anymore in, in the United States. People tend to be have su you know, sufficient amounts of vitamin A and vitamin C in their diet. However, um, uh, vitamin D is a nutrient of concern as is potassium. So both vitamin D and potassium now also have to be listed on the nutrition facts panel and then calcium and iron continue to be nutrients of public health concern. So they are also listed there. So those are kind of the changes to the nutrition facts panel um, and hopefully that will be helpful having walked through the whole label labeling process and nutrition facts panel on foods and it'll help you use them when you're trying to decide say between two different food foods um, you'll understand where these values are coming from and can use some of this information to make a health-based decision.